building envelope, attics and roofs, chapter 12. So you should print off these uh, these notes and get the PowerPoints. Um, so I'm going to be following through these notes. Uh, I'm going to try and hide the, the notes this time. I'm going to just come back to it when we need it. Um, so I'll open up PowerPoints. Here they are, this is the building envelope, chapter 12. <coughs> Well, the purpose of uh, so roof ventilation, right? Is attics and roofs. The biggest thing there is roof ventilation. The purpose for venting is uh, reducing ice damming. So ice damming we talked about uh, in class on several occasions. But basically, what it is is having heat loss through this area. So you can see my cursor. Heat loss through this area. Uh, what it'll do is actually then heat up the plywood. The plywood will then heat up the shingles. The shingles will get the snow, uh, and the water will travel downhill. So what ends up happening is this area right here is very warm and then down here is cold. So as the water uh, liquefies, it'll start running down the roof line and start to freeze and creating a dam. And then from there, water is able to then be trapped here. And over time, that water will start to go uphill because there's lots of water and it might go underneath the shingles. Uh, so if we had proper ventilation, so if we don't have the insulation touching the underside of the plywood, uh, by cold a one inch gap is what's required but two is better what that does is has cold air flowing between the plywood and the insulation which then keeps the plywood cold which prevents the snow from melting on the upper side so you can see that's kind of the danger zone right here so we're trying to make sure that we take care of that area uh, it's something that's been a problem for many years in construction so what they've done is installed e protection here to try and find that solution. We'll get into that when we move through to that section. So purposes of reducing ice damming helps cool house in the summer. And so if you have good ventilation, um, you'll actually get a lot of that hot air out of the attic. So this is kind of effects of, of ice damming. So if you don't have heat protection, what could happen? So lots of rot here. This is all rot on the plywood. I guess you see thing here, all rotted along the eave. So all that plywood is going to have to be replaced. Um, you can see it's a fairly low slope roof, not a very high pitch, therefore a really tight attic, which then means not, not good ventilation. Okay? Probably no ventilation in this area. So usually that can kind of be somewhat fixed whenever you peel up the plywood. So if you're re-roofing, you peel up the plywood, there's no styro vents in there. You can add styro vents to help with ventilation. Sometimes even if the soffit on an older home they used to do is use plywood uh, in the soffit area, which would allow for no ventilation at all. So a lot of times what I'll do is drill holes for the full saw bit, maybe three or four holes within uh, between each truss or rafter section to allow for airflow. Uh, so you actually get air coming through those soffits. So when the house was built, they probably installed plywood as the soffit, painted it white. Whenever that started to look a little bit uh, ratty looking, what they did is install aluminum soffit. Um, but never put holes through the plywood. So the aluminum soffit has holes. It looks like it's venting, but there's actually no ventilation. There's no holes for, to allow the airflow to go through. So if we get proper airflow from the soffit up to the peak, uh, we'll actually prevent so, so airflow through here, whether through a baffle or a startle vent. So soffits are open. Air comes through that crack, up the roof line, between the sheathing and the insulation. And it's supposed to pick up, so again, same thing, through the crack. You don't want that insulation spilling in here. Because then it blocks all your holes. So air up through the sterile vent into the attic. Takes all that stair, still air out of the attic and puts it through the peak ridge. So you either have a uh, ridge vent there or a maxi vent there to exhaust the air through the center of the building. Okay. Let's see if I have another picture at the top of the building. Right here. That's a perfect scenario right here. So airflow through soffit between our gap, so a two-inch gap. And if there's any hot air in here, so in the summertime, right, this is going to heat up. The idea is air flows through here, grabs that hot air, brings it out. Uh, if there's any moisture, same idea. Air flows through, grabs the moisture, takes it out. So continuous airflow through the uh, eave and through the peak. So 
there's many options for for venting at the peak. <coughs> so just making sure we're following the notes. Um, help cool house in the summer. Hot shingles heat up the attic. Um, hot shingles on the um, on the roof also reduces the shingle light. So if we can keep the, the attic cool, then we're not actually cooking the shingle from the top and the bottom. Um, if we overheat the shingles, that's when they start to kind of disintegrate and the aggregate will fall off the shingle. Uh, so venting will remove that hot air, making everything better. It makes the attic healthier, it makes the shingles last longer, um, it makes your house feel cooler. So people inside are, are happier. Um, so ventilation also helps with drying the attic in the wintertime. So in the wintertime, we're showering, we're cooking, the house is fairly airtight, all the windows are sealed, we're not um, going outside as often, so we're spending more time inside, so there's lots of moisture in the house. That moisture, if we don't have a good um, air barrier through the ceiling, so let's say if we have lights that are leaking, um, if we ever had a good air barrier, so it's an older home, and we have air leakage, where air goes, moisture goes. So in the winter time, we're gonna have moisture build up in the attic. So if we have proper venting, we'll be able to get the airflow to go through and remove that moist air in the winter time. Um, another thing is um, not enough insulation. Right? So ventilation, if we don't have enough insulation, then we're gonna lose all our heat. All our heat's gonna be in the attic. So if the attic is really warm in the winter time, that's gonna then cause problems with your, your plywood, condensation issues, frost issues. So if we have good airflow, minus 30 air flowing through the soffit here, that should flow through here and hopefully take all that hot air out. But you first should fix the problem of not having enough insulation in your attic. So in the winter time, we want that attic up here, this section of the attic to be minus 30. So if it's minus 30 outside, you want minus 30 up here. Um, in the summertime, if it's 20 uh, down here, we want 20 here. So again, we're trying to always maintain the same temperature from the attic as what we have outside. And if we can achieve that, then we have a, a healthy roof. So I'll just kind of go back to a slide that shows frost. Right here. So this is your insulation. So it looks like the airflow is not perfect. Uh, but there's probably moisture leaving the building. So not a very good air barrier on the ceiling. Moisture is getting into the attic. So it's condensing and then it's turning into frost. So it's not an issue at this moment, but as soon as it starts to warm up a little bit, things start to thaw out. Um, this will thaw and then fall onto the insulation and maybe leak into the building. Usually it's not this bad. So when it does leak, it, uh, it'll kind of be absorbed by the insulation a little bit, so you won't notice it, which is a problem. But um, sometimes it's drastic, like this is pretty drastic. So if this were to leak, you might see it seep through the drywall. But then some people think that the roof is leaking. Right? So they're, it's getting mild out, maybe the roof on this, the snow on the roof is melting. So maybe that's working its way through the shingles, but in reality it's the frost on the underside of the plywood. Um, so probably a good idea if you buy a new house, um, whenever it's, fairly cold outside, probably be a good idea to see if you have frost on the other side of your plywood, how bad it is. So you probably have some, um, hopefully not too much, but it, that's a sign of you know, heat loss, of air leakage. So, uh, you know, whether you put on uh, more, more insulation or you, you find some way of sealing your, your drywall around your fixtures, so if you have pot lights, if you have fan, ceiling fans, um, Maybe trying to air seal around those from the from the attic to make sure your air can't get through because if air gets through, moisture gets through. Uh, all those little things that could possibly stop that moisture from infiltrating through. So it's probably not your drywall. Your drywall's been taped and sealed, uh, and it has a, several layers of paint onto it. It's around all the um, uh, electrical fixtures, plumbing fixtures. So some of that stuff you can't see from below because it's in the wall, but if you go in the attic, you might be able to see them coming through. If you spray foam around the pipes, spray foam around the wires. I mean, if it's your house, you want to make sure it's, it's good for a long period of time. Um, contractors don't typically do that. They'll try and do it during the, the framing stage, but it's, it's those details that easily get missed. Um, 
kind of continuing here, so help dry. So, so basically for ventilation, there's a ratio of one square foot of ventilation for every 300 square feet of insulated ceiling. That's kind of the general rule. Um, if you have a lower pitched roof, you would want to increase that. So you can see here on the code here, so building code requires a one in 300. So for every 300 square feet of ceiling, you require one square foot of ventilation. Um, so basically what you're doing there is um, taking your ceiling area and then dividing by 300, and that'll tell you what you get for square feet for ventilation. We'll do an example of that in a second there, but I um, just want to finish the notes on that section first. <clears throat> so if you have a hip roof, so hip roofs are going to be um, tighter again. Not a lot of room for for this to, to occur, right? It kind of dies into the hip, right? So on a gable roof, every single space between the rafters is a uh, ventilation chute, if you will. When you have a hip roof where the jack rafters hit the hip, that air is then stopped. It's, it's damp, so it can't flow. So a hip roof will have a lot less of these channels to allow air to flow through. Therefore, you have to uh, increase the amount of ventilation. So in that case, it would be for every 150 square foot of ceiling, you need one square foot of ventilation, so more. So less space, therefore we need to uh, increase uh, the amount of venting. Okay, so, so either a hip roof or um, anything below 612. So if you have a, a slope on your roof that's less than 612 or a hip roof, you'd want to use the 1 to 150. Okay. Um, and in some cases, you, you'd want to increase. So if you have a um, steep roof, then you're going to have lots of airflow. So you could probably uh, reduce the amount of ventilation. Right? So by basically changing your ratio from one square foot to like 400 square feet of a ceiling because it's a higher pitch roof, better ventilation. So newer construction, you can kind of play around with those numbers, but typically the general rule is one square foot of venting for every 300 square feet of a ceiling for 612 and up. And if it's a hip roof, one in 150. So just keep those numbers in mind. Um, so maybe what I'm gonna do is gonna switch to the camera here for a second. So if we're looking at the example, the example given was a, uh, basically a, a bungalow, so 300, I guess it's on the next sheet there, the ratio of 1 to 300 for insulated ceiling. So whenever you figure out, so if you have 900 square feet of ceiling, you divide by 300, that's going to give you, uh, I guess, 3, eh? The three square feet of uh, ventilation. So three square feet, basically you need 50% of that at the soffit, 50% of that at the peak. Okay, so if we have 900 feet square of ceiling, we're gonna take that number there and then divide it by 300 if it's a gable roof with the uh, slope 612 greater. So if we go 900 divided by 300, that gives us 3 feet squared of venting. Well, 50% of that is at the soffit, and then 50% of that is at the peak. So basically, 1.5 feet squared at the soffit, and 1.5 feet squared at the peak. So we tend to overdo it a little bit, which is not too, too bad. If you have too much ventilation, you can kind of create kind of like a cyclone in your attic where the insulation is being blown around a little bit. Um, I would say you can never have enough soffit venting because there's two things that the uh, styro vents will do on the building. It will allow the plywood to stay cold, preventing ice damming, but it also helps to circulate and get rid of the stale and hot air in your attic. So if we can have 
a styro vent at every single location at the soffit um, that, would, that would be great it's not required though my code is not required but definitely a good idea the peak you'd want to pay attention that's where you're going to have the air flowing out okay so there you kind of want to try and hit that number so depending on what you're using if we try to look at the next page here and so kind of the options so 50% of the software so achieved by using styro vents or insulation baffles just go back to work so that's your styro vent that's an insulation baffle here cardboard so it comes like that there's little predetermined folds on it and it basically will follow from the outside of the exterior wall up to stop insulation from falling in the soffit then it follows the roof line but allowing for a two inch gap between the cardboard and the um, and the plywood so the cardboard is waxed I know some people might think that that might not last as long probably not the best in the world but it is waxed and then you have this kind of style here which is styrofoam so it staples to the top of the wall it goes up so no insulation can fall through and it follows the roof line but creating a two inch air gap to allow the airflow to continue okay so you can see here being installed stapled to the sides stapled all the way flush to the back of the wall so important to make sure that it's flush to the back of the wall that's where all our problems are the biggest problem is people not putting this vertical at the right spot and then we have loss of heat coming through that's where it's very important that should be pushed out as far as possible uh, but you can see the, the chase over top here here's some plywood so if you have lots of scraps of OSP, uh, a couple of 2x4s nailed to the sides, creating a 2.5 inch gap here, it looks like. Again, it should only be 1 inch, but the more there, the better. And that'll allow the airflow. So scraps of plywood, scraps of wood to allow for the channels as opposed to buying styro vents. I personally use the styro vents, uh, but on higher pitched roofs, sometimes I'll use plywood because it's, uh, I might need two of these, so opposed to using two of these. I might just use up some scraps. Okay. Some people even use styrofoam here. If you have leftover styrofoam from your walls, you can use that up here. Okay. That's the key, though, right? You see how they're curling onto the wall here? So here they put a bat of insulation, which is something that I've done um, on conventional. When you don't have a raised heel, you, this is what you would do. You put a, a dam here. So you could put a piece of plywood here. You could put a piece of cardboard here, you could put a piece of styrofoam here, something to stop that insulation from falling in the soffit. You can't have this happen. If this happens, it's going to go over top of that vent, and then you're going to cut the airflow, which is then going to cause ice damming, it's going to cause attic issues. So that's what they call damming, damming the end of the, uh, the ventilation chute. Uh, so that being said, so 50% at the soffit, using either the baffle styro vents or scrap materials. To make sure that that insulation just doesn't get into the soffit. Keep insulation from touching the underside of the roof, that's also important. And then we need 50% at the peak. Um, right, so uh, achieved by roof vents, so mushroom vents, maxi vents, bridge venting, and gable end venting. there's a mushroom vent a maxi vent that's ridge venting you can barely see it it's raised off the roof here a little bit but that's what it is here so there's like a felt it gets installed on the roof the felt is what's allowing it to breathe right here is where the air will come out so you can see it's cut back about two inches on either side to allow for airflow um, you see it stops right here it doesn't go all the way it doesn't it's not necessary to go all the way Typically, people will make it go all the way so it looks consistent, but you always have to stay about a foot away from the, the end of the building, on either side, just so you can seal this up. So you don't have um, potentially uh, bees going in here, um, flies going in here, ladybugs, all those kinds of things. So let's step back a little bit, it can actually be sealed to the roof at this location. Okay. Uh, so maxi events being fairly popular, Almost everybody tends to go this way nowadays. Mushroom vents are being replaced by maxi vents. 
so the issue with a mushroom vent is if the snow covers it. And so if you get the winter time and, and you're relying on ventilation to take care of any moisture in your attic, but the snow is covering your vent, then you're in, you're in trouble. So this is low profile, would be good in a warmer climate. It's been on our roofs for many, many years here in Canada, but now they're being replaced by the Maxi Vent, which has been around for probably a good 15 years. Um, so the difference is this is high up off the ground. Snow will not block off the venting. Um, and typically you might need like six mushroom vents, uh, where you might only then need two Maxi Vents on that same building. So mushroom vents are not going to give you enough ventilation compared to a Maxi Vent. Therefore you need more of them which means more potential for leakage because the way you got to seal around them. I like ridge vents, some people don't. Some people say ridge venting could be covered with snow because they're such a low profile. Um, personally, I've never seen snow pile up at the peak of a building unless there's another roof line somewhere else backing it up. It's usually the first spot that loses snow is the peak. Uh, so I'm a big believer in ridge venting. I don't mind the maxi vent either though. Um, so either one will work. Maxi vents are, are easier to calculate for how many you need for a roof. But uh, and then there's the gable end vent, the gable end vent, which is typically uh, almost creates a problem sometimes if you're looking at airflow. It can divert the air in the wrong way. So you gotta be careful. Sometimes if people want to put in a, a vent up on, on a gable end, uh, I'll just suggest them we're gonna put it there cosmetically and not cut the hole, not allow it to breathe because then it changes the flow of the air. We want the air to flow through the soffit, up the line, and out the peak. Where if we have gable end venting, then we have cross, cross breeze. We have air going across this way, following the ridge. So it can actually interrupt the flow of air that's going from the soffit to the peak. So it can cause a problem. Um, therefore, uh, I tend to not have those uh, open. So let's go back to our example here. So let's put the page. So there's our example, kind of we already started. So 900 square feet divided by 300 gives us 300 feet square of ventilation. So one and a half on the roof, one and a half at the soffit. So then we kind of have to break that down. So a mushroom vent. So let's just look at mushroom vents to begin with. So mushroom vents are actually, we just took a look at a picture of one, but the flange outside to outside is probably closer to like maybe 14 inches by 14 inches. And then the vent itself is probably 12 by 12. But then the actual hole through the roof is only 8 by 8. That's something you'd have to verify. Uh, but 8 by 8 leaves you a hole that's 64 inches squared. So then what we have to do is put that number um, into inches. In inches squared. So we multiply by 144. That will then give us uh, so 1.5. So because it's feet squared going to inches, we're multiplying by 144. That gives us 216 inches squared. So that's how much ventilation we need. One vent will give us 64 inches. So if we divide by 64, it'll give us the number of vents. So 216 divided by 64, it gives us 3.375 vents. So let's say four vents. Okay. So that's in your notes, right here. It's a 1.5 times 144 gives us 216. 216 divided by the size of the vent gives us the number of vents. So we'll always round that up. So we'll need four mushroom vents or a building with 900 square feet of ceiling. So for using a maxi vent, it's really easy. Um, they're basically set up to square footage. So on the box it'll say good for 400 to 500 square feet or good for 700 to 800 square feet. Um, so we'd have to use model number 301 which is pretty common. So most of the time you're going with this model here which is the one I had on the picture. Uh, so it's good for a thousand square foot ceiling to 1200 square foot ceiling in that range. So sometimes you need two of them depending on the building. So it's a two 
thousand square foot home, you'd be using two of these. So you, you, on a smaller home, you can pretty well get away with one. So we had four mushroom vents, or if you use a maxi vent, you're using one of them. Uh, so ridge venting, a little different. Same kind of idea, but um, it requires two inches of clear span or clear space at the peak. So you got to make sure you cut the plywood back two inches down on both sides to achieve a one inch clear opening per side. So truss blocking reduces the opening. So truss blocking or the ridge. Here you see here that's the ridge. If this was a truss, there'd be blocking there as well. So we got to make sure we go below that to get airflow. Okay. Um, so that's what I mean by truss blocking could reduce it. Uh, then you need to determine the length of the ridge venting. So how much venting do we need? So we want a two inch gap. So take the required venting at the peak and divide by two inches. So we need 216 inches squared divided by two inches. Uh, and that will give us uh, 108 inches. So we need nine feet of ridge venting on that building. So a building 900 by 900 could be a 30 by 30. So the ridge might be 32 feet. Of those 32 feet, we only need nine feet of, of ridging. Right? So if, 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 imagine a building being like that, a gable, let's say. The distance from here to here could be 32 feet for a projection. Right? The building itself is only 30 by 30, make 900 square feet. Uh, so we only need nine feet of that building to be vented. We can go a little bit more than that to make it look good, but at least we know what we're covering code. Okay. So then we have the gable end venting could disrupt the flow of air from soffit to the peak, which is something you got to keep in mind. A lot of people that have trouble with a hot top floor think their attic's too hot. But what they'll do is try and put a gable and vent in to try and cool it off. That's not the problem. More than likely, there's no airflow at the soffit. Uh, and maybe there's not enough roof vents. So, uh, again, a lot of people that do roofing do not know that there's a ratio of 1 to 300. So when it, whenever they go to do a roof, um, if there was four mushroom vents there, they'll put four back on. If there's two, they'll put two back on. Um, or they'll maybe throw on a max event and then it, then they're getting lucky because it's actually covering more more uh, ceiling but um, so if you have, again if you're building a house you're gonna have to follow code but if you're doing a renovation job that's something you gotta keep in mind if you're re-roofing somebody's house don't install the same number of mushroom vents that were there do a calculation make sure um, there's a proper number there so try to avoid mushroom vents in my opinion move to a maxi vent or ridge venting uh, but do the math to make sure you have adequate ventilation at the peak you also have to make sure that the soffits are open that's the biggest problem if we put vents at the top of the roof and have no soffit venting there's no airflow right no air is going to move out of that attic it'll just move by uh, natural heat rising slowly work its way through the peak where if we get air coming through the soffit it'll just naturally push it out and that's what you want a continuous flow of new fresh air coming in maintaining um, that air making sure there's no heat there and that there's no moisture there so moving on to cathedrals so maybe I'll just get back to the slides here so cathedral roofs so ventilation options so ventilation on a cathedral roof so cathedral means a slope ceiling so this is not 100% cathedral it's got a sidewall a slope ceiling and then a flat ceiling across the top so somewhat cathedral but it's a good picture to show what, what would happen so a cathedral ceiling requires insulation in this area so we got to make sure that the insulation does not touch the plywood for most cases one option is to spray foam this area so no styro vents spray foam right tight to the to the sheathing uh, then having no uh, no ventilation so that is a possibility um, but you want to make sure that you have enough insulation on the warm side and you'd probably want to put a layer of foam on the roof so it adds another element of difficulty not only are you f playing around with the inside of the building but you're also changing the outside of the building so the best option i like it i like ventilation so having the styro vents there then spray foaming on top of the styro vents 
um, to then create your uh, your channel. So some people might use plywood in this case if they're going to spray foam to make sure that they don't compress the star foam. Star foam baffles are very flimsy, so if you spray foam that and the insulation were to compress uh, and expand, it might push the star foam tight to the plywood. So that could be an issue. So using scrap plywood, creating a two inch channel, and then putting the plywood below that two inch channel would be uh, probably the best scenario for spray foam. So you get the best of both worlds. You have ventilation from the soffit all the way to the upper section. So you have airflow going through, and then you'll have also your spray foam going through, okay? So here you can see soffit comes through, air flows up. There's a full, some, somewhat of a full cathedral. So soffit up, following that startle vent, comes out the peak, okay? So every chase, in this case, if it's cathedral, every chase has to have airflow because they're, they're not mixing. The air from this cavity is not mixing with the air from that cavity. So if I were to only do every second one, the ones in between have stale air, possibly moisture that are stuck there. It's not an open attic. It's closed between rafters to rafter or truss to truss. So all areas need to be ventilated. Uh, on a gate roof, we typically do that as well, but not, not necessarily on a uh, on a on a gable roof. So plywood let down minimum two and a half inches creates space for airflow, possibly bigger rafters. So another option is to just jump ahead of this for a second. So another option is to go with a bigger rafter than your insulation. Okay, so what's the size of uh, insulation we require so typically it's uh, two layers of R20 so R40 that's what most people will put in place uh, which would be about 11 inches okay so if you went with 2 by 12s it would give you a one inch space not quite enough so you can maybe jump up to an engineered material for uh, rafters to then get two inches so if you oversize your rafter to make sure you have two inches of space above the mat, then you don't need to put styro vents there. So that's a another option. You might spend a little bit more money on the rafters, but you can use LSL, LVL uh, rafters to then get a wider material to then allow for the 11 inches of insulation to then get two inches above that. Okay. So that's one option. So this is a picture from your building science textbook. So figure 12, 13, okay? There's a gap created by oversizing your material. Um, so R40 is actually above code. So we go back to that code picture I had here. So we live in uh, Ottawa. So if we look at this first page, acceptable solutions for energy efficiency compliance after December 31st, 2016. That's what we should be reading. Um, energy efficiency, so we have to determine zones, so if I, that's why I put this here, so zone 1 with less than 500, or for 5,000 heat to new days, so if you actually look up Ottawa in SB1, I think I have a slide further down the line here, SB1, come on now, It's not inked over. Right here. So this is under SP1. So I actually have this under your course documents. So SP1, we looked at this last semester. You can see Ottawa here. We looked at it for snow load. So we go all the way down, snow load. So 2.4 plus 0.4, so 2.8. I think it says 2.9 on our handout. Snow load, but if you go back to this column, degree days below 18 degrees Celsius. So Ottawa is 4,600, okay? We'll talk about that a little bit when we get to heat protection, what it means, 
but SB1, depending on where you live, you take a look under heat days of 4600. Okay, so if you go back to that chart we were just looking at. To it. Nope. All one. So 4600, right? So Ottawa is 4600. So zone one with less than 5,000 heat degree days. So we're 4600, so we're zone one. So now we'd have to look at the chart for zone one. So compliance packages for space, heat, and equipment. So these are the packages that uh, you need to pick from. So basically all your R values for certain areas, um, so whether it's ceiling with attic space, ceiling without attic, exposed floors, so cathedral, or a cantilever, cantilever floors, or a floor over a garage, or a floor over a crawl space. Walls above grade, so our exterior walls, basement walls, R values. Uh, below grade slab, so we have a slab below grade. What's the air value for that? It's not even required, nothing. Uh, heated slab, so if you have radiant heating in your concrete in the basement, what's the minimum R value required? Um, edge of below grade slab, less than or equal to 600 millimeters below grade, so if you have a frost wall basically, uh, what is the R value for that slab? Window and siding, so R values, so actually U values for windows. So U values works a little differently. Um, the lower the number, the better the window. Okay. Skylight, same idea, U value. The lower number, the better the skylight, better efficiency. Uh, space heating equipment, so the efficiency of the equipment. HRV, so heat recovery ventilator, is it required? And what is the efficiency? Domestic water heater, energy efficiency, reading. Okay. There's your readings. So if you look at the top, zone one, which is our area, compliance package for space heating equipment with annual fuel utilization efficiency of greater than or equal to 92%. So basically uh, high efficiency furnace, high efficiency space heating equipment. That's one chart. So I click to the next chart. Zone one, compliance package for space heating equipment with 84% uh, less than or equal to the annual fertilization. So they're basically between 84% and 92%. No, below 92% and less than or equal to 84%, sorry. Okay, so basically below 92% you'd be in this range. So you're not, you're not spending as much on space heating equipment. Therefore, our values are probably going to be higher. Okay, so look at the here we're spending a little bit more money on our MV, uh, our heating equipment, so our values will tend to be a little bit lower. They kind of try to offset the cost a little bit. So if you're going to spend more on your equipment, you can then save on insulation for the meantime. Eventually, they'll crack it all down and it'll, it'll be a uh, standard across the board. Uh, but for now, they're trying to ease people into it. They don't want to push contractors away. So they're trying to make it a slow progression. And there's also electric space heat. So depending on where you live, you might not be able to get uh, natural gas or uh, propane. You can get propane anywhere, but the cost might be too high. So some people might, might want to go with electric space heating. Then there's only four packages. And you'll see that the air values are quite high here. Uh, because electricity is expensive. I'm trying to kind of push you away from that. So all these components on the left are the same on all the charts and then there's packages right so for high efficiency there's one two three four five six packages mid-range efficiency there's one two three four five six packages and then for electrical space heating there's only four okay so if you kind of look maybe ceiling without attic for the first one so ceiling without attic r31 right across the board that's what we're looking at right cathedral ceilings ceiling without an attic so r31 now i go to the next package so mid-range same thing r31 
if we go to electric, R3 going across the board. So it's not changing for the ceiling. Um, so let's just look at ceiling with attic. High efficiency, so 60 for package one, 60 for package two, 50 for package three, 60, 50, 60. So high efficiency furnace. You still want the air value fairly high there. Okay, go to the next one. So that they've dropped it down to 50 here, which kind of seems weird. A lower efficiency furnace, they're allowing for a smaller R value. B4, which is nice, so they actually want 60 as the R value for a ceiling with attic, and they want HH. HH is actually high heel truss. You see down here, HH equals 10 inches of high heel. So a high heel truss. So this is a very decent package. I like the start of it anyways. It's R30, exposed floor. That's a little low, 31. Everyone else is 35. Look at the insulation. So VAT 22, 7.5 continuous, which will not perform as well as you would think. We, we did testing on those. In the basement, R12 with 10 of continuous insulation. So they want to have a styrofoam glued onto the concrete with an R value of 10, and then 12 inch VAT in a wall in front of that. And then everything else below that is windows and stuff like that. We take out the uh, high energy efficiency. There's a nice package here. These are good numbers. So 35 in the floors. Good numbers in the vats and continuous. Low on the ceiling. So you're just looking at the different packages, right? Uh, if you wanted to follow code. The other option is following Energy Star or R2000, which would not be following these numbers. Um, so that's enough on these charts. Basically what we're trying to, to look at is ceiling without attic. All the same. That's where it's coming from. Okay. So we'll jump ahead. So back to where we were. So the note said requires R31, zone package for zone 1. Um, this is another option. Instead of putting styro vents from the, uh, from the uh, soffit all the way to the peak. This is a system where you actually roll out Tyvek. So Tyvek, and then they have these cardboard U-channels that sit on top of the paper creating a chase. So basically, this could also act as your, uh, almost like a vapor barrier, if you will, to stop the uh, moisture from going through. Okay? But it's also creating a channel to allow airflow. So just underneath the plywood. So a nice, quick way of doing it. And it's doing two things. It's giving you a bit of a moisture barrier as well as a, a vapor barrier. The vapor barrier would be closer to the exterior, but um, I would still follow with a smart vapor retarder on the inside just to ensure proper ventilation and proper air sealing. Okay. Um, when you're looking at insulating a cathedral ceiling, so bats required after a 312 slope. So blown insulation will roll down the slope and compress. So once the slope of the roof is 412 or higher, you require bat insulation to fill those cavities because blown in insulation will not stay permanent. It'll roll. It'll actually roll down the roof line, compressing at the peak and creating a void, which then will, will allow for heat loss. There's the gaps here. There's code. This is the caption of the code book. So minimum one inch. So per performed bathroom must provide minimum one inch of clearance. Uh, two inches above insulation. Clearance and extend two inches above insulation. So it's going to extend two inches above the insulation this direction. So create a one inch gap and two inches above insulation. So pass. So two inches is, is to me kind of playing with fire because if somebody comes in and tops up their insulation they add six inches of insulation now the baffles no longer good so I like to bypass my styro vents past the insulation by about a foot to allow for future um, future uh, upgrades of insulation here's some um, 
for showing your you basically have a story and have attic ventilation. So the building is insulated all the way around the perimeter and you need to make sure you have airflow throughout that. So a lot of older homes, story and a half, they don't have this. Usually it's blocked off here and this whole area is not breathing and there's usually lots of ice dams here. Lots of icicles hanging off the roof in the wintertime because of poor ventilation uh, and lots of heat loss. Another option for cathedral ceiling is putting the insulation on the roof. There's your roof deck. So you can actually take your insulation. So for older homes or renovation jobs where you want to maybe add some R value. So maybe in the winter time, you can actually see your roof rafters through the frost, uh, which is thermal bridging, heat coming through the rafters and then melting the frost on the shingles, uh, which means you get a lot of heat loss. So if your house has um, no snow on your roof and all your neighbors have, have snow on their roof, that means you have lots of heat loss. So maybe if that's a cathedral ceiling, um, it could be difficult to add R value. If it's a flat ceiling, you can go up there and add more insulation in the attic and try and air seal around all the plumbing and, and the electrical wires coming through. Um, but if it's cathedral, you're, you're limited. So that you'd have to then take off the shingles and potentially insulate from above. It's costly, uh, but this is an option. So here you can see they're actually putting sleepers down on the roof and they're insulating in between. So they're still going to have thermal bridging here, but they're increasing air value a little bit and then they strap on top of that to allow for airflow. So here's another scenario. So you see how they strap twice? The first picture didn't really show it well, but so they strapped vertically first and then horizontally second to allow for airflow. If they only go horizontally, what they've done is cut the airflow. There's no airflow at all. Right? And if any moisture were to get underneath those shingles, if you're strapped horizontally, the water's trapped at every single strapping. So by strapping vertically to begin with, and then horizontally afterwards, you're creating a channel to allow the water to come out, a channel for ventilation, to keep things cool and and uh, dry. Okay, you can see here that they, there's the original deck. They insulate it on top, put a membrane on top of that, and then they're strapping and making ventilation above. So maybe there's no ventilation chutes in the attic, so they did it above the roof line. Make sure the roof line is, uh, is cool. Here's another option with metal. So the metal actually has small little grooves into it. So if you're going to go with horizontal, they actually have this product, little grooves to allow the water to flow through, also to, to allow airflow. Okay, two things. Here's another situation. So again, maybe this is showing a flat ceiling, but um, it could be more cathedral. So plywood, membrane, two layers of styrofoam then sleepers on top of the styrofoam. This is like a mesh, so it'll allow water to come out and it'll allow airflow to go through. It just prevents rodents from getting in there, okay? Uh, but very good situation, right? So if this is cathedral, you have lots of thermal bridging on your roof, lots of shingle deteriorating then prematurely. This is an option. Add maybe a couple layers of foam on top, increasing your air value, getting rid of the thermal bridging, and then adding ventilation above that. Same thing here again. This is more probably a passive home, but you can see a nice timber structure uh, across the front of the building. And then they're, they're using a, a low density fiber board. So that's our value. Um, not sure the R value per inch, but pretty good product for passive homes. It's used on the walls here, you can see as well as on the, on the roof. Sometimes three inches thick. So it might give you like an R10. Uh, and then from there, sleepers on top of that, sheet on top of that, and then uh, leaf protection, underlayment, and then your shingles or tin, whatever's going to go in the place. <coughs> you can see they actually put a valley leaf protection before they're doing all this, and they'll probably do it again. Uh, more the better. This is a uh, just an example of a, I just threw that in there, an example of a roof basically that um, is poorly done. So they strapped this regular one by three strapping. So they put synthetic membrane on, they put the strapping on, and then they're going to install tin. So a lot of people do this. 
Uh, but then what ends up happening is if there's any leakage, again, the water hits this strap and it stops. It'll travel horizontally until it finds a hole. So a screw or a nail and then goes into that hole. It might trickle through a little bit and travel horizontally, find another hole. So you're not getting the water out quickly. Anytime we have any kind of a finished material on top of a secondary plane of protection, you want to make sure the water gets out there quickly. So a lot of people are avoiding strapping horizontally if they can, or you leave voids. And if you, you have no choice but to do this because the budget doesn't allow for anything else, leave a hole every so often. So maybe like a three inch hole, three inch hole, three inch hole, just to allow airflow and water to get away if it possibly can. Um, but best would be to run uh, strapping go in this direction first and then this direction second okay. like this exactly like this so strapping going this direction so it's a rough rough meaning it's not hasn't been planed so it's probably exactly one inch thick by probably three or four inches three and a half four and a half inches and then strapping on top again so strapping doesn't have to be the most expensive stuff in the world you can buy it rough uh, for a roof and so what this is basically doing is allowing for water to get out and allowing for airflow while still allowing you to strap for your tip. Okay, so if it's a barn, then strapping this direction only is sufficient. It's when you have a heated space below. If it's a garage, same thing. Strapping horizontally, it's not heated, and you're not going to worry about condensation issues. Okay, just make sure we covered all the notes for this. Next is trust uplift. Okay, it occurs in winter when upper cord of truss contains more moisture than the lower cord. So basically the upper cord is above the insulation, therefore it's cold and damp. Right? So this top section is above the insulation, so it's cold and damp. The bottom, lower cord, is covered with insulation. Okay, so that bottom cord is covered with insulation, therefore it's warm and dry. So there's a difference in humidity from upper components to lower components. And what ends up happening is the upper components will expand. When they expand, they're going to go up. They can't go down. And if they're nailed down, which they shouldn't be, they can't go up. Or they can't go down, sorry. And so they have no choice but to only go up. So when they decide to expand up, they grab the bottom core and lift. So what that ends up doing is actually cracks the drywall in this corner. Okay, cracks the drywall. The drywall comes up the ceiling. The drywall comes uh, sorry, up the wall and on the ceiling and it gets taped there with a piece of tape and mud that's only so strong if that's actually trying to, to lift uh, it'll crack that drywall joint to the point where sometimes it even grabs onto the double top plate and rips it up a little bit it'll lift it a half inch off of the top plate uh, so that's truss uplift so that only occurs in the middle of the building or if we have a wall here if we have a wall here that's where the problem is it's not near the exterior walls it's near the central wall on the building so the truss wants to go up in the middle on a larger span and that causes uh, drywall to crack. So how do we prevent that? The biggest way is a clip or uh, floating the corners. So if we look at the options here, uh, solutions, so design roof with shorter truss spans, so that then there's less uplift. Use half span trusses, so half span trusses meaning have the trusses land, so this is one truss one component right and it gets linked to this component but it gets installed in two different pieces so this is a load bearing wall all the weight is transferred onto here so half span truss so then all the weight is actually in the middle so if there's any truss that uplift that's going to occur it's going to occur over here so you're kind of reducing the span so you're putting all the weight where it normally would cause truss uplift that's one way to eliminate it so half span trusses, so all the weight is on the central girder or load bearing partition. So basically not allowed to bow because all the weight is pushing down on it. Another solution is using kiln drying wood for manufacturing trusses. That's, that's now standard. Um, but the, the, the key is how is it stored on site? How is it stored at the, at the yard? So once the trusses are made, are they protected from moisture? So do we throw a tarp on top of the trusses until we go to use them? That'll help a little bit, but depending on how big your tarp is, it can actually trap moisture. 
So you want to make sure that your tarp is not draped over top of the trusses and touching the grass because then you're creating a greenhouse. Moisture will not be able to escape from the ground. So if there's any moisture in the ground, it's going to be trapped in that tarp, making it worse. So just covering the top of the truss uh, with a tarp or sheathing to make sure that moisture is not getting in, into those materials. Making sure the trusses are up off the ground on blocking. So again, moisture from the ground cannot get into the wood. Making sure they're also nice and flat, just to ease with um, putting the trusses up. Um, properly vented attic space, so making sure that the attic is properly vented, removing the moisture uh, will then help to reduce the issue with difference in humidity from top core to bottom core. That's not going to solve the problem entirely, but that's part of the problem, right? Trying to get rid of excess moisture in the attic. Okay. And usually an issue on an older home is um, the soffits being blocked at the bottom, right? making sure you have good airflow at the bottom. So styro vents put in place, no insulation in the soffit area. So solution, probably the better solution, is the use of a drywall clip. So if you use your drywall clips, they get nailed into the, the, the interior partition. So the drywall on the wall will uh, basically butt up. So the ceiling drywall will go into this clip, stops it from falling down. Then the interior drywall, so always ceiling first, and your drywall in the room. That way there, the wall drywall will support the ceiling. Okay. So there's no fasteners here. It's just a drywall clip every so often. I'll be like two, two feet on center to then have the drywall slip into it. So the drywall clip nails to the top plate. The drywall from the ceiling slips into that clip. That stops it from falling. There's no fasteners. So we say from uh, 12 to 18 inches. From here to here, no fasteners. Why? If we fasten the drywall to the truss and the truss were to go up, we're going to get a drywall crack. So that's called floating the drywall. So if the truss were to lift in this location, it's not fastened to the truss, therefore it won't crack. The drywall will stay put, the truss will go up, and we won't have a drywall crack. So trying to make sure that we do not fasten the drywall close to where truss uplift can occur. Okay? So trusses are not nailed down to the wall, they're fastened with a clip. The clip gets nailed to the top plate, and then there's a slot on the vertical portion of that roof clip and then we nail into the truss so that stops the truss from going back and forth this direction maintaining the on center spacing but it also allows the truss to go up and down so if it were to expand and want to go upwards it can go up if it wants to come down it can come down right so you see here there's a gap so maybe that truss was designed with a crown or the contractor left a gap to allow the roof to settle uh, so by having a slot there, leaving that fastener loose, it allows the top of the bottom core to go up and down. Okay. So that kind of solves the next two items. So drywall clips, which are nailed to the central wall, to then support the drywall ceiling. Uh, so they, they don't necessarily need the roof truss, truss, uh, roof truss clips at the same time. So if you're using the drywall clips, you don't necessarily need the roof truss clips. What some people will do is just have strapping butt against the sides here to make sure that it can't move. Um, or you can put a block of wood here and a block of wood on the other side. That'll stop the trusses from going back and forth. They're not nailed though. So two by four here, butted against the truss, not too tight. Two by four on that side, butted against the truss, but not too tight. That stops the truss from going this direction. Um, but it's not fastened, so it still allows the truss to go up and down. Then with the use of drywall clips and floating the corners, um, you'll prevent the, the, uh, the cracks. So truss uplift creates cracks on ceiling and wall connections near the center of the building. So the next note talks about roof truss clips. So Simpson Strong Ties has a roof truss clip which is L-shaped. Horizontal portion is fastened to the top plates. We just talked about that. The vertical portion has a slot into it. It's fastened to the bottom core of the truss, allowed to go up and down. The next note, floating the drywalls in the corner, uh, here is a must. Ceiling drywall is not fastened within 12 to 18 inches from the central wall. This allows for drywall to separate from truss, not cracking the drywall corner. So that, that note goes with roof truss clips. So floating the drywall corner, 
goes with roof truss clips. Um, so if you're using the roof truss clips, you got to float the corners, okay? And then the last option is kind of the way that I like to do things is to strap the ceiling with one by three strapping at 16 inch on center. So Paul, you can go on the entire ceiling first. So the first thing you have to remember is chalk lines for strapping. So mark out your strapping at one end of the building, mark out your strapping at the other end of the building, and then chalk lines to then show you where the strapping goes. Then install your six mil poly. So staple it, overlap the joints, tape the seams because that's your air and vapor. Uh, and then from there, install your strapping on top of that. Uh, and then from there, we'll install our interior walls. So our interior walls then get connected to the strapping and the strapping, strapping will act as a buffer. So if the truss were to try and lift up, it's lifting up on the strapping, not necessarily on the drywall, reducing the effects of uh, the truss uplift. Um, so I still try to make sure that my drywall in the corners are floated, okay? If I'm using that method, but it acts like a buffer. Okay, but I have pictures of that. But There's pictures a little later on there. We'll, I'll, I'll make sure we discuss it when we get there. Next section of notes is, is ice damming, so caused by inadequate insulation on top of the exterior walls. Uh, poor ventilation on top of the exterior walls, so a little bit of both, right? So we've already looked at that a little bit when we talked about ventilation. So ice damming, we talked about that already a little bit. There's a little more in depth. Um, where is it needed to extend so because we have ice damming issues we kind of came up with a band-aid solution of installing eave protection uh, to stop any water that might make its way under the shingles from coming into the structure so we're kind of saying we're basically accepted that shingles um, might allow the water to go through because of ice damming so ice damming we looked at on the slide right here so we, this is the vulnerable spot where we have heat loss heats up the plywood, melts the snow, and as it works its way down, this section's cold because it's there's no heat loss here, so this is cold, so then it freezes. That mound gets bigger, creating a dam, so again, the next day, heat from here melts the snow, the water falls into that dam, it's now getting trapped, and then it tries to work up the shingle, so it goes underneath the shingle, and potentially falls into the attic. So by code, what they told us to do, this is actually the code here, so code 9.26.51, so part 9, section 26, uh, subsection 5.1 talks about eave protection needs to extend horizontally 300 millimeters in from the inside face. So 3 millimeters in, which is 12 inches basically, 11 and 3 quarters to be exact. And if you went up vertical from there, that's minimum where the eave protection has to go to. So it's not a 3 foot piece of eave protection. It's not 36 inches, or it's, it's not a standard one piece of ice and water shield at the bottom of the roof. If you have a large overhang, you might require two rolls of E protection. So where the E protection stops is based off of code. So again, a lot of roofers, again, they're not trained uh, on building science, right? They, they've been hired because they're not scared of heights. Um, and you, usually, after that, the job becomes pretty uh, repetitive. So from one job to the next, typically what they'll do is do what they did on the previous job. So if the previous job had one row of ice and water shield or heat protection, then they'll do the same on the next job, not even looking at the building, not even looking at the overhang. Um, again, never do something without knowing the reason why. The reason why we put heat protection there is to stop ice damming, and the problem can occur within a foot from the inside face of the building. So they're saying this is the vulnerable area. This is where the snow is gonna melt. So they wanna make sure the E protection surpasses, probably a stop about here. Right? So they wanna make sure that E protection passes the problem spot so that water can't travel that high, get over top of the E protection and fall into the attic. E protection is a peel and snip membrane. When a nail goes through it, it seals, so we're fairly well protected from here to here as long as the water can't travel above it. So that's very crucial. Stop your E protection 
when it's from the inside face, one foot in horizontally, and you go up vertically from there. So never be shy to overdo it. Um, uh, otherwise, you're going to get callbacks. Rotted plywood. Rotted plywood, right? Rotted plywood here. And all, usually the face is all rotted. Some of the rafters are rotted. It can create a disaster. And obviously water in your ceiling. So this is like another code caption. It's a 926.5. Eve protection. There's the exact sentence. So Except I'll provide in sentence 2. Eve protection shall be provided on shingles, shape, or tile roof extending from the edge of the roof. Uh, to a minimum of 2 foot 11 up the roof slope to a line not less than 300 millimeters inside the interface of the exterior wall. Okay, so minimum is 2 foot 11, but also keep in mind it has to be a foot within. Okay, it can't be any less than 3 feet, but may need to be more depending on how far uh, projection is. Another item I'm going to need a little bit shortly is. What is it required? E-protection is required. E-protection is not required over unheated garages, carports and porches, where the roof overhang exceeds 2 foot 11 measure along the roof slope edge to the roof interface and exterior wall. Uh, on roof of asphalt shingles installed in accordance with subsection 926.8. On roofs with slopes 1 in 1.5 or greater, or in regions with 3,500 degrees or fewer degree heat days. So, in regions with 3,500 or fewer degree days. So, Ottawa's 4,600. So, if it's less than that, then we do not require it. Most companies now require it. So, code sometimes, it, it says this here, but if you actually look at your uh, shingles, uh, it, it may be required to, to get the warranty. Like, GAF requires it. Uh, other companies will require it as well. So, always make sure you read manufacturer specs as well as follow code. So most people will have it on there, but the key is if it's over unheated garage, carport or porch, it's not required. It's only if it's heated space. Because heated space is going to have heat loss. Heat loss is what creates the ice damming. And that's the reason why we have eave protection. So if it's unheated, it's not required. Okay? So this is not very clear here, but degree days below 18 degrees Celsius. We look at the code already. But uh, Ottawa, 4602 here. I think if you click on this link, it'll open up, but I have it here as well. Ottawa, 4600. EW days. So Band-Aid solution. So we went over that. Required overheated spaces. A little more details there on that slide. Um, heat degree days. So basically what heat degree days is it's the sum of the difference between below 18 degrees Celsius temperature and 18 degrees cutoff. So basically there's an 18 degrees Celsius cutoff. So if it's basically if it's warmer than 18 degrees Celsius, ice damming is not an issue. So if the temperature goes below 18 degrees Celsius, that number is then tabulated. So how do they get to 3,500 degree days? So in Ottawa, we have 4,600 heat degree days how did they come up with that number? So basically what they did is um, any number or any day where the temperature was below 18 degrees, they took that number and tallied it, right, write it down on a piece of paper. So for every day of the year, when there was a temperature below 18 degrees Celsius, they took the difference. So let's say one day it was 16 degrees. Um, that's two degrees less than 18. So they wrote down two for that day. Maybe the next day it was 14 degrees. Uh, so that's a difference of four. So they write down the four. So now we have six uh, degrees of difference for the first two days of the year. They continue doing that for the entire year. So if it's below 18 degrees, they take the difference and they add it up throughout the entire year. At the end of the year, they tabulate it, and that's where the number comes from. So in Ottawa, there's 4,600 degrees calculated, uh, basically, where it's below 18 degrees Celsius. So depending on where you live, so basically the higher the number, uh, the colder the environment. The lower the number, the warmer the environment. Right? So that's kind of where it's tabulated, and, and that's found, like I said, in, in SB1, which is this chart here. This chart is only one page of several. Right? So it's, it has all of, this is from the Ontario Building Code, so it has all the 
bigger locations in Ontario. Okay. So if you look at maybe some warmer climates, so Niagara Falls is a little warmer, 3,700. Uh, can't really read that there, but that one's 3,800. Oakville, 3,800. Okay, so. Some of them are, are a little bit uh, close to that 3500 heat degree day uh, cutoff. So we continue here. So, type of heat protection self sealing bitmus membrane for peeling stick. Um, dealing with this situation, the best solution is achieving good ventilation in that area. Keeps the plywood cold. So, ven ventilation baffles, styro vents, will help with ice damming. So the styro vents help with uh, ventilation of the roof, but also helps with ice damage. So it does two things. Make sure to dam the end to prevent wind washing. So that's damming the end here. So that's a raised heel truss. We're going to insulate this area. We don't want that insulation to fall into this soffit. So what somebody's done here is installed a piece of plywood, which is fairly easy. Strips of plywood cut and nailed to the ends of the trusses. Helps to stiffen up the trusses laterally and also blocks the insulation from falling in. You see some kind of a sealant here. They sealed the OSB. Maybe that's acting as their air barrier. You see it's a double stud wall. So more than likely this is a uh, uh, energy efficient to build maybe a passive home double wall you see the studs are staggered so the insulation will flow through it it's really sealed uh, here's a look from the outside this is a different style truss though it's a cantilever it's still a raised heel uh, what they've done is they cut the plywood to go around to stop uh, the insulation from falling into the soffit so make sure to dam the end to prevent wind washing so if Otherwise, the wind will blow through here and interrupt all the insulation. And if it's blown in, it'll move all that insulation to the other end of the building. So if it's bats, you still want to have a dam there to stop the wind from hitting the insulation. Because if you have wind blowing through the bat, it'll actually separate the bats and air will get in. Um, and where air goes, moisture goes. So plywood, styrofoam, cardboard, uh, roof baffles, fiberglass insulation, something to stop that insulation from being blown around. Another way to prevent, uh, so there you see it on the, out of the textbook, a little chunk of plywood to stop the insulation from getting blown around. So that's bat insulation. It's not going to go anywhere, but you still want to put a piece of wood in front of it to stop the air from going through those fibers. There's your baffles. End dam. Okay. Baffle. Another solution is to raise your... Uh, your heels on your trusses. Okay, make sure you have good R value here, which that means less heat loss and then good ventilation as well. Trusses is the next section that we're looking at. So many different styles of trusses help achieve good ventilation as well as high R values. So a few of the SP12 descriptive packages ask for HH. We look at that when we're looking at the packages um, and with an R60 uh, insulation. So HH stands for high heel truss. The code actually specifies being a 10 inch height. Um, so basically what that does is ma make sure that we have full coverage of insulation. See how the insulation here is coming in? Full coverage, not being compressed at all. That's what we want. Same thing here. Full coverage. So it's not being compressed where it's vulnerable, right? Typically we lose lots of heat from here through a standard house. Let's try to find a bad one. These are all good. Raise heel. Right here, this area very thin. Like that, that's maybe it's about five inches. So that's lots of heat loss occurring there. Lots of heat loss. That's not warm enough. The attic is said that to need R60 now. So if that's five and a half inches of wood, I guess that's your fascia point, probably five and a half. That's the same size. That's R20. So that insulation at that location is being compressed to R20. The rest of the ceiling might have R40, R60, but in this area it's down to R20. 
So lots of heat loss is going to occur there. That's why we have the ice damage problems. So how do we fix that? Make sure we have full coverage. So raise the heel on the truss to allow for the insulation to get in there. And then um, not having an issue. And then it's going to maintain the two and a half inches gap. Okay. Another option here is a drop core truss. So the first two trusses we looked at, raised heel. So horizontal block here. That's how we did our models in structures two. This is a cantilever. So this bottom core goes right through and then top core ties into it. You have to have a block here. That has to line up with the exterior wall. So a cantilever, but still gives you that raised heel effect. Uh, this is kind of like the reverse. So a drop core truss. So it drops down into your uh, living space. But again, keeping this area warm. Right, so this is all attic, basically. So that within, then they drop the ceiling. So the walls have to be a little bit higher. But uh, it does the job. It keeps all this area warm. You don't have any thermal um, bridging through this area. And good ventilation. Lots of ventilation here. The insulation stops right here. So you're getting almost three and a half inches of airflow. Scissor truss, so cathedral ceiling. So instead of using rafters, using a scissor truss to, to achieve a cathedral. So if this is a 612, typically the ceiling portion is half of that. So that'd be a 312. So that's a 812, that's a 412. And what that does is make sure that we have enough insulation here to not create a problem. So it mimics like a rafter. In the old days it would be a rafter and you'd insulate in between the rafters, but that's not good ventilation. So how do you avoid that? You want a cathedral ceiling, you use scissor trusses. Lots of room for insulation, lots of room for airflow. So you see the insulation here? On a cathedral ceiling, it only needs to be R31. Again, it's not being compressed because of the scissor truss. A rafter would only be maybe five and a half inches, two by six, right? On an older home. Um, not too many two by eight rafters on older homes. So we only have about three inches where it's vulnerable. So new construction, avoid the rafters, unless you're going to use like an engineered material. Uh, use a scissor truss to then get that proper spacing to get R value and ventilation. <coughs> so we looked at all the different types there. I believe. Here, the last one's parallel core. So parallel core, so that looks like a rafter, right? So the top core is parallel to the bottom core. But again, it's a truss, so they're able to put a fairly decent width in there to then achieve insulation and airflow. Again, you can see the insulation where it stops. And there's airflow above it. Same thing here. Insulation above it. Okay. This one here is sitting on top of the wall. So getting good air value all the way to the exterior, so it has to be insulated to here. You need to have a dam there. And this one here is not sitting on top. So again, this is all going to be insulated, therefore stopping heat loss where potentially it could create a dam. So all these trusses dealing with making sure our value, where it's important, is achieved. So the advantage of these trusses, depending on the truss, uh, main intention is to increase the insulation over the wall plate, preventing ice damming from occurring, allowing enough room to install ventilation chutes that do not compress the insulation at the top of the plate. So minimum one inch, but two and a half, two inch recommended. Some allow for full depth insulation, which is ideal. Uh, there's one there that actually helps with uh, truss uplift, so drop core truss actually helps with truss uplift. Okay. Disadvantage, add, there is added cost. Uh, for some, wall height is higher, so therefore more siding or brick required to cover the wall. So a little more costly that way as well. So the, the truss itself is more expensive, there's more finish required. Uh, but the advantage there is also you have more brick above the windows, so it looks a little more appealing. So a little bit of an advantage within the disadvantage uh, requires longer studs. For some, the truss is part of the wall and needs to be sheathed and finished with cladding. So kind of tying it together there. Then we move on to flat roofs. Uh, structurally designed to take additional loads, so it has to take a load of the snow, possibly mechanical equipment if it's a commercial building, or even if it's residential, uh, but not very common. Uh, roofing product. So. Uh, and, and possibly people. So sometimes if you have a flat roof or a flat section over a garage, 
uh, that might be covered with a deck. So you got to make sure you're allowing for the weight of that deck as well and the people that are going to be on top of it. You also have to allow for um, possibly collection of water. What are you going to do with that water? Where's it going to go? So sloping the water or going to some kind of a drain somewhere to then get it off. So a scupper to get the water off the roof. Different types of membranes used on flat roofs. Uh, they're sheet vinyl membranes. This is the sheet vinyl here, I think, on the picture. Um, there's also a torch knot. That's a membrane there as well. Here's a torch knot membrane. So usually the fire protected coating below that. So there might be a layer of like a low density board. And then from there, they're installing paper on top of that. And then the actual uh, torch knot membrane. <coughs> And then there's tar and, tar and gravel. So maybe this is more commercial, but some R value there. So some kind of R values, then some asphalt, then a, uh, a cover board, so like a medium density or low density board, more tar, then a membrane, more tar, membrane, more tar, membrane, and tar and gravel. Okay. You can see here the gravel kind of stuck in to the, uh, the tar. Um, with some of these roofs, ventilation is, is a factor, so they have to make sure they implement that into the design. And this one here had some ventilation at the bottom here, I suppose a little bit, but nothing really to say. So if they have a high R value, that's not an issue, because a dew point will occur outside of the uh, space. This one here, not much of a, again, not much of a ventilation. There's a little bit of ventilation through these almost like a plate system. <coughs> so you can see styrofoam membranes, uh, drainage layer, and then textile cloth, and then you got your, your green roof. Okay. Here is using like a SIP product. So SIP, so structurally insulated panels. So styrofoam with plywood nailed down to the top of the roof. So it looks like it's actually screwed down with long screws and a washer. Um, flat roof an access a hatch uh, and then from there it's going to receive more likely a vinyl membrane or a, or a, maybe a torsion membrane okay. uh, so just finishing off with flat roofs before we move on to this uh, permits use of a garden roof so if you have a flat roof you can get a garden roof on top so or a green roof lots of care for insulation of membranes. You can remember that if there's a problem with the membranes, that green roof has to come off uh, and then from there be repaired. So making sure that membranes are, are done correctly, don't cut corners, don't buy cheap products, uh, make sure that you're uh, hiring somebody that knows what they're doing. That's going to be a company that's going to come in and do that. So look for reputation, look for, uh, for, um, References, so you can take a look and see what, what they have done. Uh, so the garden roof has a lot of advantages, keeping the building cool, also absorbing some of that moisture, which then keeps the building cool. Also adds a uh, R-value property as well, right? Any kind of material that has any kind of voids is going to stop heat from escaping. So um, it helps out with two things, a little bit of uh, insulating values, as well as keeping the building cool in the summer months. So the moisture in the ground will then make sure that the roof is not overheated, transferring that heat to the inside of the structure. So pretty good advantage, but uh, high cost. Um, and you want to make sure you do things correctly. Controlling air leakage at the ceiling. So moving on. Controlling air leakage at the ceiling. So there's our ceiling. So this is typically what's happening on a lot of homes nowadays is the SPA method. So figure 12.5 from the textbook displays maintaining a continuous membrane through partitions. So when you build your partition wall, we have a piece of pl plastic flapping through. So we did that uh, in semester one. And then from there, the ceiling poly will then tie into it, making it continuous and sealed. Okay, So it's acting as the air and the vapor. So sealed poly approach across the ceiling. Um, this is not the way I build houses. I build houses having the plastic, plastic go right through the entire structure, then I strap the entire ceiling, then I build the interior partitions. Uh, why? To avoid having joints like this at every single partition wall. Um, kind of almost doing the ADA approach, but no drywall. Just using 6mm poly and strapping, then install the walls. Um, 
So this is fairly common though, very common way of doing things. The key there is to make sure that things are sealed, overlapped and sealed. Um, try to make things as airtight as possible. When you look at the AD approach, so figure 1216, um, you can see basically potentially poly strapping and drywall are installed onto the ceiling to begin with. The drywall is coated with one tape, one coat of tape and mud to ensure air sealing. So all the joints are coated with mud and then the tape is embedded into the mud, minimum. And then from there they can actually uh, put up the walls. Um, so basically that drywall is acting as the air barrier as well as the fire barrier. Okay, so is it required? No, but it's not a bad idea. Okay, do you see that happen a lot? No, it's not very common. Um, it would require lots of coordination with trades. You'd have to make sure that um, all the wiring for the ceiling would, would be done. Anything that had to go up a wall into the ceiling would have to be taken care of. There's minimal, not a lot, but every time you have the light, the wire would have to go up to the switch. So from the switch, the wire goes up to the ceiling uh, for the lights. So all that would have to be taken care of beforehand. Um, so coordination of that could be an issue. You could do it afterwards as well, but then somebody has to go through and seal all those holes. Um, so as long as somebody's taking care of that. Uh, the, the other method, which is the method um, that I would use, would be, um, which is kind of the R2000 way, is to poly the entire ceiling, strap the entire ceiling, so before you put the poly up, make sure you strap, uh, chalk your lines for your strapping. That's something that I've done often enough. So you kind of got to remember to do that first. Chalk first, then poly. So chalk the lines where the strapping is going to go. Then install your poly. Then strap the ceiling. Then you can frame your interior walls. Uh, and what that does is make one continuous piece of plastic. Uh, the plastic on the ceiling would have to be overlapped and seams taped or sealed, so tape preferably, because sealing it needs to be sealed up against a solid surface and that's not possible on a ceiling, so tape the joints. Um, and then you need to put your walls up. So I usually use a strapping on the floor and a strapping on the ceiling, so those two strappings take up the double top plate. So when I frame my interior walls, they have one bottom plate and one top plate. There's a strapping on the floor and a strapping on the ceiling that takes up the double top plate on the exterior walls making the height of all the walls the same okay some people leave out the floor strapping and have a gap to allow for expansion or uh, compression shingles kind of uh, adding weight to the trusses and the trusses settling a little bit i like to keep things fairly tight i, I figure wood is um, is kiln dried shouldn't have an issue so I, you know, that's kind of the way i like to, to tackle it but there's other ways of looking at it so that this method uh, creates a continuous vapor, achieving minimum joints. So a lot less joints on a ceiling done this way than the SPA approach that was shown in the first slide. Minimizes labor cost, because there's less ceiling to do. Uh, you don't have to add plastic in between the two top plates on the interior walls. Uh, and it, also, it also helps to reduce truss uplift, because the, the strapping acts as a buffer. Uh, other areas that you have to try and concern yourself with. So here's poly going on. So this is a SIGA, which I believe is a German company. Pretty good product, though. They make a lot of good uh, flashing tapes. Uh, here they're putting a membrane on the ceiling prior to. Okay, there's your cathedral ceiling. Looks like a floor joist. They're installing membrane on first. Okay. That wall seems to be installed after the membrane. They, they didn't strap it. They went on they don't have that memory. That's another way, right? They didn't strap it. They just nailed that to the to the other side of the truss. So here you can see membrane, strapping, then wall. Makes so much more sense, right? Otherwise, they'd have to have this wall would have to be built prior to, which would be hard first of all because it's on an angle. Uh, then they'd have to have poly in between that. That poly would then have to seal to the poly on the roof. So this is another method. They have the Membranes going through, looks like small little panels going right through. They left a gap. Probably going to tie that in later, but the walls are currently braced. Um, 
held basically where they need to be in line until strapping is put in place. Once the strapping is put in place, they'll nail into it. Preferably, I would prefer to see strapping go on first, then the walls go up, then you have something to nail them to. So here they put little blocking. Same thing here, blocking. So instead of strapping it right away, they've put blocking. And then they'll nail the wall to the blocking. So blocking is nailed to the blocking on, on, in the roof, potentially, and then the wall gets nailed to the blocking. You see that all over here as well. To me, that seems like a lot of work. Why not just strap the entire ceiling? Here, you can see the same method. It's a half-story house where you have strapping on the wall. So I do this all the time. I talked about it in class quite often. So walls strapped as well. So insulate, plastic, uh, and then strap the wall. So do the same to the ceiling. Not, not insulate if it's a flat ceiling, but if it's cathedral, you'd have to insulate, plastic, strap, and then the wall goes in later. So this just makes more sense, in my opinion, to make sure that your barriers are fully through. Okay. Again, you can see here, strapping, going through. Okay. This is a first floor to a second floor. I just kind of, the same idea as that. And on a first floor, we do it, we seem to do it right on the first floor. Like, the, like I said, this is the way I do it on every single building. Strapping goes through and the wall goes on top of it. Not everybody does that. Um, but they'll do it from the first floor to the second floor. So interior walls, so that's your first, second floor floor joist. They strap it, then they build walls on top of it. So the same thing could happen on your upper floor. For some reason, they just don't do it. Here you can see again the strapping going through. Wall nailed into it. Here they're using two by two, so that's actually inch and a half strapping. So it's insulated, plastic, then they strap it, and then electricians can actually run their wires through this inch and a half void. They can drill their holes, run their wires through, put their boxes in. So all the uh, wiring is on the warm side of the barrier. And then all the wiring does not affect the barrier. It doesn't go through the barrier, so you don't have to seal it on all those holes. Again, here's another, not a very clear picture, but the wall is strapped. You see the boxes, the wires running in front of the block poly. You barely just see the wire running. Okay. Plumbing and electrical. So if you look at plumbing through an attic, so obviously this is a partition wall. So there's a piece of plastic through that partition wall. Plumber drills a hole through it. You've now broken the um, seal. So a lot of times what they'll use is a gasket that you use on the roof. And they'll put that over top of that wall plate and then seal it. So then they added a piece of plywood on top of that to act as like a washer to then hold it down. But they seal that gasket to the plastic. See right here? So the plastic on the ceiling was put in place. They drilled the hole through, created a gap. So air seal around it, not too many people do that. Like most people won't even go back and caulk it. So caulking, seal it, so acoustic caulking, not a bad idea or the gasket that you use on, on a roof. Rubber, so neoprene rubber gasket. Acoustic caulking underneath it. You don't necessarily need the acoustic caulking around here, but you could, okay, to make sure it's all one. So anytime a plumber drills holes through your walls, that should be sealed. Uh, here you can see what's coming through. You got wires coming through, you got uh, plumbing coming through, maybe going for a stack. So that's, that's gonna go through the roof at some point. But these are your basically your, your stacks of air behind water. That has to have a pipe going through the roof. So these are tying to a bathroom, maybe to another bathroom, to another bathroom or a laundry room. <coughs> so when those come through, they have to be sealed. So here there's spray for it. That's another good option, right? Once all this work is done, a small little thin layer of spray foam to seal around all these holes would be a good idea. And then from there, blow on top of that. To spray foam the entire attic would be too expensive and not really cost effective. Like blown insulation does a good job. But if you put a thin layer of spray foam on the entire bottom floor, do so you see how there's no six mil poly here? So maybe this is a renovation job. Older home, never had poly there. So how could you air seal an older house, possibly remove all the insulation? So there are actually companies that'll come in there and they'll suck out all the insulation. 
you can then put a skim coat of spray foam and then follow with matte insulation to get your proper R value afterwards. So like a one inch, half inch coat of spray foam just to air seal. <clears throat> so if you have electrical boxes, making sure that they're sealed to the poly. Pot lights, making sure they're sealed to the poly. There's usually also a big gasket that goes around it to hold the insulation back. And you're not allowed to have insulation touch a light fixture because it'll catch fire. So there's a certain distance between the fixture and combustibles. So there's a big gasket. I brought it into the classroom the one day there. I was holding all my insulation with it. It was blue. Uh, but that will go around and surround the fixture, making sure that insulation does not touch the fixture to catch fire. But it also creates that seal. There'd have to be one hole cut through that gasket to allow the wire to go through, and again, that would have to be sealed. So here, a chimney coming through. So there's your poly. So you can see that they're sealing the poly to the wood. So they're going to create a solid gasket in the wood. The so poly seals to the wood on all sides. And a piece of plywood goes over top and then seals. And then you seal around the pipe and the joint. So there'll be another piece of plywood going here as well, creating an airtight box again what typically happens is they puncture a hole through the six mil poly uh, and that's it nobody fixes it nobody comes in and seals it afterwards so it's hard to seal the plastic around the pipe so what they've done is they sealed the plastic to this wood to this wood to that wood and to that wood so the six mil poly sealed to that wood and then what they're doing is creating an airtight seal within this frame so then they put gasket so caulking on top a layer of plywood on top, caulk around that circle, caulk the edges, and another piece of plywood, and then again caulk around the rest of the ring, trying to be as airtight as possible. And again, a lot of work, a lot of detailing. It's something that people don't necessarily see. Once that six mil poly's on, and you're standing below it, you're, it looks like you're looking up at a ceiling. So to actually see this detail where there's a breach in the system, um, you'd have to go into the attic. So first insulate and then seal properly to make sure there's no issues there. Okay. Attic hatch is also called scuttle. So this figure here is figure uh, 1219. Um, again, one of those things that gets put in place and people just seem to not treat it like a door or a window. And that's basically what it is, is a door or a window. This is a wall you have to maintain air leakage, vapor, moisture, uh, and thermal. So, a lot of times nowadays, this hatch door is actually a piece of metal sandwiched in between poly isosanderite. Okay. So you need to have weather stripping on the door. So this is the door. The door has to be weather stripped to the jam. If this is the jam, we have to insulate between the jam and the frame. So spray foam potentially in this area, all the way around the perimeter. Uh, and then from there, we need to add insulation to the hatch. So if this is R60, this should be made R60 as well. So glue on styrofoam to the hatch to make sure you've achieved the same R value as the entire ceiling. Otherwise, this is a weak point, and that's where you're going to have lots of heat loss. Okay, so air sealed, so moisture can't get through, through air leakage. Uh, increase the R value, and you seal around the perimeter. See little beads here, little circle? seal it, spray foam, or, or caulking, to make sure that uh, there's no heat loss there or um, air leakage. Here's a uh, code, so the minimum size for a um, typical uh, attic hatch is 500 millimeters by 700 millimeters, so 19 and 3 quarters by 27 and a half. So we typically say 20 by 28. Um, you also need to have basically two feet, 600 millimeters or 23 and 5 eighths of head space above the hatch to allow somebody to be able to get in there and do work. Okay. So attic hatch is not required unless the space is over uh, 10 meters squared or 108 feet squared. So every attic space must be provided with an ask attic access or hatchway if the area of the attic is greater than so it's less than this I'm not worried about with a dimension greater than three foot three and attic space is more than 
23 and 5 eighths at the highest point. So if it's smaller than that, there's no sense in having an attic hatch. You, you can't get in there anyways. Okay. So that's right from the code. So, nine, so part 9, section 19, subsection 2.1. Uh, exhausting bathroom fans, so if we're still talking about um, kind of the um, air leakage. So exhausting bathroom fans to the exterior, not into the attic. So you see that a lot where people are exhausting bathroom fans into the attic space, adding moisture to the attic, which creates frost in the wintertime uh, and lots of mold issues. Same as dryer vents. They should not be exhausted into an attic. They should go outside through the roof. If you have to go into the attic space for some reason, don't go through the soffit, go through the roof. What ends up happening is the, the wind will cut off the flow from the vent. So if you have a soffit vent for your bathroom or a soffit vent for your dryer, the wind comes, bounces off the wall and cuts the flow. So it stops the air from flowing out. Have it through the roof, it'll exhaust out and the wind will grab it, push it away. And so preferably through the roof, okay, not in the soffit. Um, another issue with air leakage into the uh, attic is not enough ventilation or it's done incorrectly too much venting can blow insulation around okay sometimes the gable end vents actually cause a problem uh, we talked about already it'll just kind of break the flow so again think things through make sure you don't try to fix something by creating a problem um, so another one here is existing roof rafter with no room for venting and insulation so it could lower the ceiling height just enough to increase the air value I thought I had that picture in here somewhere but let's see it sure I put it in but maybe I forgot to save it huh. I'll just open up the textbook there it's figure 12 12 Come back to the camera for a second here. Figure 12, 12. So an another way to deal with uh, kind of air leakage is to uh, drop your ceiling. So if you have an, an older home or even a newer home, uh, but you have high ceilings, you could drop your ceiling height, which then gives you more R value uh, and a better way to, to insulate and prevent it and damage or ice damage. So if you drop your ceiling, it gives you more R value which then prevents heat loss um, and also allows for proper ventilation. Instead of stuffing this area with insulation, we're able then to drop the insulation and allow the airflow. So another possible solution. It requires higher walls to maintain ceiling height. So with new construction, we have to raise the, the wall height, but it's, it's a way to do something potentially um, on a existing structure if you have high walls to begin with or if you don't care if your walls are low and down just slightly enough to get the air value to prop to then get the proper ventilation there's also uh, unvented roofs we'll go back to the slides here 
I don't know if I, mean, I had pictures of my vintage piece too, but. I guess that's one there, unvented roof. So a sit panel would be considered to be an unvented roof. So um, usually uh, not really recommended anywhere but in northern regions. Um, the reason is is that if it, in northern regions there's fine snow because it's so cold. It almost turns into like a sand. Uh, and that fine snow worked its way into the ventilation system uh, and then caused problems. So they've kind of chosen to go without ventilation so higher R values um, to then create no issues with condensation within the assembly pushing the condensation to the outside um, so again it's it's permitted by the National Building Code of Canada if it's been proven that ventilation is unnecessary or going to cause a problem so you kind of got to ask for approval by a building official and it is permitted by the National Building Code but it just needs to be proven that ventilation is unnecessary then there's no issue with going ahead with that so special, special uh, situations so northern regions so roof must be built tight to prevent snow from blowing in so still an issue with making sure that no snow blows in to begin with air sealing and heat loss through the ceiling must be reduced as much as possible um, snow is not allowed to accumulate on a roof so wind must blow it off so if that area has uh, typically 16 km an hour wind speed um, that will be adequate to push the snow off the roof if not somebody has to go up on the roof and make sure they remove that snow okay otherwise there's going to be some issues there basically with over overheating overloaded so overheating the insulation acts as kind of a uh, as our value and then from air causing problems with with uh, with load snow melting and an extra load on the roof so they want to make sure that they remove the snow off of a unvented roof okay and i believe that is it yeah. make sure the slides here this doesn't belong to that chapter but i guess that's it